Today we're going to look at how to write an effective scene. Now, what is a scene? You've got your plot. You've got your characters. Maybe you don't have all that much, depending on how much you want to plan in advance. But still, you've got some rough idea of where you want to go with your story. And now you have to actually write it. So how you write a story is basically you have scenes. Scenes are flexible building blocks that you build your story with. And usually a scene will take place in one place, in one time, and will have just a few characters and maybe one or a few actions. So they are sort of strung together to make your story. When you're writing a short story, scenes are usually um, uh, identified by um, empty lines. Uh, when you write a book, it could be that one scene is one chapter, but very usually within one chapter you will have several scenes uh, and then you have empty lines to indicate those. So what is the purpose of a scene? A scene has to work for your story. It either has to advance your plot or it has to advance your character development. Ideally, it does both. So what do you do in your scene? Well, Ursula Le Guin talks about crowding and leaping, and both those things are important. Crowding is when you put a lot of detail into your scene, and leaping is when you just leap over things, like there could be whole days or whole weeks that aren't mentioned in the story, and then you just skip over. It's very important to know when to do what. So when are you going to zoom in? When are you going to skip over? And that really helps you decide whether something should be a scene or not, because there's lots of things in your, in your story that are just not going to be spelled out explicitly. So you skip over the unimportant bits that don't work for your story and you just focus on the important things. And within that, you can use sensory details. Sensory details help you to make a story come alive. They also say something about the story and about the situation. So, for example, suppose somebody has a lamp in the shape of a moon, and that's very interesting uh, and could add uh, sensory detail. But unless that thing does anything in your story, there's little point in putting the moon-shaped lamp in. For example, you could think about moon symbolism, uh, such as the moon being fickle and unpredictable or mysterious. Uh, and so that, that could be one reason to put it in. You try to arrive as late as possible in the story, uh, within the scene, and you leave as early as possible. So, for example, suppose Emily meets her friend Jasmine Overtee and realizes during this meeting that her husband has been cheating on her with Jasmine. So where do you start? Well, you could start with Emily leaving the house, getting the car, getting into it, driving to Jasmine. Uh, they say hello and so on. The tea is being put. So you could do that. But it could be just boring for your audience. So it's probably just better to start with the moment that she's already in the house. And you can just basically add one sentence saying that she was visiting her friend. Scenes work very effectively if you create tension. Tensions or obstacles, uh, tensions between characters, something that changes. At the end of the scene, you must get the sense that something has changed. If nothing has changed whatsoever, then you should consider maybe cutting the scene. So either the world has changed because the character has done something or uh, some of the characters have done something uh, or the character's perspective has changed. Now, how does this work in practice? We're just going to have a look at the beginning of Ken Liu's short story, Paper Menagerie and we'll just analyze the beginning to get a sense of how this works. To see how effective scene construction works, let's consider the beginning of the short story, Paper Menagerie by Ken Liu. One of my earliest memories starts with me sobbing. I refused to be soothed, no matter what mom and dad tried. Dad gave up and left the bedroom, but mom took me into the kitchen and sat me down at the breakfast table. Can, can, she said, as she pulled a sheet of wrapping paper from on top of the fridge. For years, Mom carefully sliced open the wrappings around Christmas gifts 
and saved them on top of the fridge in a thick stack. She set the paper down, plain side facing up, and began to fold it. I stopped crying and watched her, curious. She turned the paper over and folded it again. She pleated, pa packed, tucked, rolled, and twisted until the paper disappeared between her cupped hands. Then she lifted the folded up paper packet to her mouth and blew into it like a balloon. Come, she said. Lao Hu. She put her hands down on the table and let go. A little paper tiger stood on the table, the size of two fists placed together. The skin of the tiger was the pattern on the wrapping paper, white background with red candy canes and green Christmas trees. I reached out to mom's creation. Its tail twitched and it pounced playfully at my finger. Rausa, it growled. The sound somewhere between a cat and rustling newspapers. I laughed, startled, and stroked its back with an index finger. The paper tiger vibrated under my finger, purring. Chi jiao chi chi, mom said. This is called origami. So, what we see in this particular scene is a conflict. It starts with a conflict, a young child who's sobbing. We know it's a very young child because it's one of his earliest memories, so maybe three or four, who refuses to be soothed, a recognizable situation. Then you see some of the dynamics between the couple, the dad who gives up and leaves the bedroom, but mom who persists, and then she shows him the origami. She pulls a sheet of wrapping paper from the top of the fridge and so you get a bit of character development because mom, who's one of the main characters in this story, is the kind of person who slices open the wrappings around Christmas gifts and saves them on top of the fridge. So you get a bit of an insight into her character and then she starts folding it. She folds it and the child looks at it and then she shows, she speaks Chinese to the child. She shows the child how uh, the how the paper thing comes to life. Now we immediately get the sense that this is not an ordinary story. This is speculative fiction because normally origami doesn't come alive. And the child and the mother, the, the conflict in this situation is resolved because the child no longer cries. Uh, whatever made it cry has stopped. But um, you see how uh, there is something new introduced, namely magical origami. Now, the mother says this is called origami, but we, as readers, know this is just not ordinary origami. So this scene does a lot in terms of character development and in terms of uh, introducing what kind of genre the story is. So, finally, once you've put all those scenes together, you go through several drafts of your story and at some point you have to make decisions and very often those decisions, like with writing an academic paper, involve cutting. Cutting something that is really good and that's often the hardest thing to do. Something can really be nice, atmospheric, beautiful, startling, but if it doesn't fulfill a role within that string of beads from which you make your story, then you should consider cutting it out. So you have to look at those scenes with a dispassionate view and cut out the ones that don't work. That's it.